Hello and welcome everyone to the Capital Mind podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit capitalmind.in and if you'd like to invest with us, do visit capitalmindwealth.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Mind may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi everyone, we're recording this from our brand new Capital Mind office in HSR Layout. It's Google Maps and Swiggy findable. Uh, so anyway, Deepak, uh, interesting stuff happening in the world as always, but this time it's in the space of debt. So what's happening with debt mutual funds? They're not going up and some people on the internet are using four letter words like loss. Is this really happening? Yeah, Shrey, I think, you know, the, the chickens have come home to roost in a way we've had situations where debt mutual funds which were considered to be the safe investments are now getting into this territory where they are actually losing money and not really because interest rates are going up but because the underlying bonds that they've bought are actually coming to a point where they can't return any money. We've seen that happen in ILFS in September where ILFS was considered to be this AAA fantastic debt. A lot of mutual funds held it. A lot of companies held it. And then LFS turned out that to be bankrupt in uh, more ways than one. And now any fund that held ILFS debt, ILFS bonds, uh, is seeing that ILFS is not returning the money and therefore uh, their investors effectively lose money because they're effectively channeling their investors' money into uh, these ILFS instruments. And some of, because if they have a 5% holding in that ILFS bond, the ILFS, uh, the mutual fund has now lost 5% because ILFS hasn't been able to pay back anything so far. Uh, the situation is weird, it's strange, but it's evolving. It's also coming to a point where India is coming to terms with the fact that a lot of debt that has been taken is probably not sustainable and not just have banks seen the damage, now mutual fund investors are seeing the damage as well. All right, so let's just get to the nuts and bolts. How does a debt mutual fund lose money? I mean, both now and in general. And why is this happening now? Yeah, so, uh, you know, debt mutual funds haven't always been safe in the sense that you there is a potential of loss of capital because you put your money into a fund and the fund invests in something and that something's value can go up or down. We've seen that in equity. But debt as well can see prices go up sometimes because let us say the market interest rates fall. When they do, uh, the bonds become more expensive. It's an opposite effect. So if market interest rates fall, bonds become more valuable. When, when bonds become more valuable, you will see an appreciation in the prices of those bonds, which will reflect in your mutual fund value. Now, if interest rates were to go up for any reason, market interest rates, this means that the bond values will fall. If the bond values fall, then I, if I hold a bond and I bought it at 100 rupees, but today the buyer on the market is only willing to pay 90, I have a 10% fall in the bond value that I hold. And a mutual fund can hold 100 or 200 or 500 different bonds. And if some of them start to fall in value, the mutual fund as a whole can actually be seeing a loss that uh, uh, it, it reflects. This is called interest rate risk. But the other big problem, if it holds 500 bonds, for instance, may be that a few of these bonds don't return any money. And they don't return any money. You end up with a situation where that much percentage of your fund, which is invested in those bonds, is suddenly at risk. So if you have lent 100 rupees out to a person who's not giving you back anything, that's 100 rupees you no longer have. So you're, you lose 100 rupees out of maybe a 5,000 rupees that you invested in the bond. So your bond value falls by 2%. This is credit risk. So effectively, uh, an ILFS was credit risk where you gave money to ILFS, but if ILFS didn't return anything back, so until it does return anything back, you're literally down how much ever you've invested in ILFS. ILFS may return money, may not. Now this becomes subjective because At some point, uh, debt mutual fund has to have some regulations around when it takes losses and when it doesn't. Uh, SEBI prescribes that if your bond is investment grade, that's fine. You can use a valuation matrix provided by Chrysler or one of the providers. If it falls below investment grade, that means uh, there there are investment grades like AAA, AA, AA, AAA, 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 AA
But when you fall below triple B to double B or B or C, you end up going down at least 20% in value. So if the bond was bought at 100 rupees, you're supposed to market at 80. The idea here is something below investment grade, you may not recover the full 100 from that investment. So you have to market down by 20%. You can market down more if you like, but you can you have to market down by at least 20%. If the bond goes into default, which means it's got an interest payment due or a principal payment due and hasn't paid anything, you have to take a 50% hit. Now, a lot of people did a 50% for ILFS and later they found that ILFS is not paying back anything and then they took another 50%. So a Tata short term bond, for instance, or a Tata corporate bond fund uh, a few days back uh, uh, took a 50% hit because earlier it had taken 50% on whatever it owned in ILFS. It, it had about 10% of its investments in ILFS. So, that yeah, that's again the problem we're coming to. I think what's happened now is that a lot of funds have found themselves, uh, you know, swimming naked when the tide's running out. Uh, we thought mutual funds would diversify. We don't buy a mutual fund unless it has 50 stocks or 70 stocks. So one particular stock falling should not affect it so much. You would assume the same would have happened to debt mutual funds. Why would you concentrate your risk on one company or two companies owning 20% or 15% of your assets? But mutual funds have done it. They have actually lent something like 5, 10, 15% to one company or group. In that process, what's happened is your funds have become concentrated. You've had a 15% exposure. But remember, you're, they're just the conduit. You're the one who's lending effectively. You're the bank in this case. So it, what's happened it, at, the, at this point is that because you have a 15% concentration in an ILFS, if there's a loss, like I said, they went to default. Um, uh, uh, when they went to default, you saw a 50% hit. That means if you had 15% of your fund, you saw a 7.5% cut in your investment NAV. After they realized that they couldn't get anything back from ILFS, you saw another 7.5. So a total 15% hit that has happened to you as an investor because your fund has chosen to concentrate its investments in companies like ILFS. And sometimes it's not the same entity. It's ILFS, it's ILFS investment managers, it's ILFS something else. It's multiple companies of the same group. The whole group went bankrupt. Nothing that you could have predicted one year back perhaps, but when it happened, it left a lot of mutual funds too concentrated in a certain set of securities. It's happening now again with Z, it's happening with DHFL. A lot of, comp of mutual funds have concentrated themselves in, in these bonds a lot more than they would have liked. Typically, I would have said any fund should have at least 120 different uh, 100 different say securities. So you are not exposed more than 1% to the same group, maybe 2% because you've taken two companies, but most funds have 4 or 5% in one single investment. And um, uh, that provides for concentration risk. And sometimes they'll have 4% in one, 3% in another company of the same group. So that when the group gets impacted, you get impacted big time. This is what's happening now. And that's why debt mutual funds are seeing those four letter words and you know, even four letter words like ILFS and DHFL and all of those other things also start coming into play. Um, why is this happening now? I mean, what's changed? Uh, are we just unlucky or what's happening now? Well, I think the history of this is quite interesting because, you know, people went to mutual funds primarily to save themselves on taxes. Fixed bill deposits were taxed at about 30% or your marginal income rate. Uh, capital gains tax applies to mutual funds. So as a debt mutual fund holder, you don't have to pay any taxes on any gains until you actually exit that fund. So a lot of people moved their money to debt mutual funds. But at the same time, they weren't really aware that the risk is theirs in a fixed deposit. If you give a bank a fixed deposit, the bank lends that money to somebody else. And the somebody else defaults, the bank takes the hit. Your fixed deposit is safe. In a mutual fund, uh, the mutual fund just on lends. So which means that if the default happens by the end person who's buying the bond, who's the bond is being given to, you are at risk. So you are the bank. Uh, the knowledge of this has not been, you know, widespread and mostly these things have been sold as safe, extremely safe investments. However, what's also happened is because mutual funds saw so much money coming in, they start chasing yields. So a lot of yield chasing meant that companies uh, that didn't didn't deserve to get any money, they couldn't borrow from banks, they couldn't borrow from other sources, they've gone and borrowed money from the 
mutual funds. Mutual funds have been happy to lend to them as long as um, you know they were able to return the money. And a lot of them borrowed money with these uh, using companies that um, didn't have any operations. They just borrowed, uh, uh, you know, the promoters of companies who wanted cash for whatever reason, sometimes to set up their own ventures or to do some other kind of uh, investments which are not related to the main company by using the their own company's shares as collateral. But apart from the collateral, the mutual funds had nothing else. There was no cash flow in those businesses which were borrowing money. So they were, uh, what would happen was they would borrow the money, it would run for four years, there would be no need for any cash flow because they got something called zero coupon bonds, zero coupon debentures, where you don't have to pay any money until the end. It's a cumulative large interest component. And at the end, you may get the money back, but it's actually a rollover. So what happens is they issue new bonds, they use the new money to pay back the old money. This is a sort of a Ponzi, but the idea is as long as the shares are there as collateral, you don't have to care. Except in Z's case, they found out the hard way that they do have to care. They have a 9,000 to 12,000 crore uh, share capital that's been pledged. They can't even sell 200 crores worth of shares without dropping the price by 30%. That is uh, scary because you have collateral that, but if you try to actually sell that collateral, you won't get anywhere close to the value that you've, you've lent. And if you don't get the value that you've lent, you're not going to get anything else because the company has no other cash flows. So you end up with a situation where mutual funds own these things. They think they have collateral, but they really don't. And that situation is compounded. That's There's DHFL, which has cash flows, but you're not sure of how they are. There's ILFS, which does not have cash flows and uh, has assets, but you can't sell those assets like you can't sell a road overnight. It's going to take you eight months. Eight months, you're going to not get any interest on the investments that you already made because all they're going to do is try and pay back what they should have paid back a year back. And, you know, these are the complications of debt markets in general. You're facing what is called the credit risk issue and Uh, It's boomeranging now because ILFS caused a problem. Mutual funds didn't roll over debt or didn't want to roll over debt. Why? Because their investors saw losses. When investors see losses in mutual funds, debt mutual funds, they take their money out and put it into fixed deposits in banks. If mutual funds don't have the money, they can't roll over this uh, uh, mutual fund bonds uh, that are borrowed by promoter companies because they don't have the money. They They need the money back. The promoter companies at the same time do not have money to pay back in the first place. They always expected that they could refinance. Without refinancing available, you suddenly have an issue like Z where Z cannot repay and some of the lenders try to sell the shares, the shares fall 30%. Suddenly everybody is aware of this problem because now their collateral is not worth what their loan is at this point. And suddenly, you know, the system kind of breaks apart. Wow. Um, it, just now that you say this, so let's put this in maybe a global context or, or from a different era. Uh, can you share an example of maybe when something like this has happened either in India or abroad at a different time frame just to help us understand yeah, how fact, this may... Credit risk was what started off the 2008 crisis. If you look at 2007, July, nobody thinks of that as the beginning, but that was when two Bear Stearns funds, which were invested in subprime securities, Broke the buck. We broke the buck in effective in the US means they took a loss. Now money market funds are, are funds which invest in very, very short term debt. And they lost money. Now when they did in July, you saw a whole tumble happen in the, in the space around uh, uh, subprime debt. This subprime debt ballooned, ballooned even further to the point where Bear Stearns collapsed in January 2008. That was about seven months later. Once Bear Stearns collapsed, it was forcefully sold to JP Morgan, but that collapse had had uh, uh, problems internally. It shook the system a lot and then created cascading effects downwards and all the way to where the point where Lehman went bust. And when Lehman went bust, everything, the system in the US was much more levered, of course. There was 30x and there was massive derivative exposure. We don't have that kind of crisis here yet, but the credit crisis triggered this. Now, there have been multiple credit crises. There have been credit crises in 92 in the US called the savings and loans crisis, where uh, banks failed uh, or saving loan, non-banking lenders failed. And you had a big crisis and that had to, that required a rescue from the Fed. In India, we've had crisis in 2000, uh, 
uh well we've had multiple layers so we've had individual banks that went through a crisis but a credit crisis of some sort was there in 2013 where we saw interest rates spike up to 9 9 and 1/2% and created problems in 2000 uh, um uh 16 when there was demonetization a lot of microfinance borrowers defaulted on a lot of microfinance nbfcs which meant that that had a effect on their uh, crisis we've seen these in the past some of them have a potential to blow things up because some firms can be so badly over leveraged that if you take away their ability to borrow they are finished that's exactly what happened to lehman lehman was fine until they could roll over loans but the minute they couldn't roll over loans they were bankrupt it was literally that one day that they couldn't roll over that they were bankrupt enron similar situation enron was a fraud but as long as it kept rolling out its loans it was fine when people figured out that it was a fraud and they didn't roll over loans that it was finished a lot of indian banks and uh, indian uh, uh, nbfcs are potentially on the territory of either people think they're a fraud or are refusing to roll over loans for any other reason and if they are not well capitalized they can end up going bust so that's where we are i don't think it's going to happen because rbi is on this case they're going to probably help change things soon because a systematically important lender anybody who has more than 10000 crores of lending is not going to be allowed to go down you know without an rbi coming in and trying to rescue them so i mean these are not very reassuring comparisons so let's just bring it back to to our end audience customers and investors so us as investors in these mutual funds and then customers what do we do now how do we adapt to this like new reality so i think the reality is that there is risk in mutual funds we have to understand that we are the bank when we are lending to mutual funds which are investing in debt it is our job really to make sure that we understand what kind of risk we can take if we can't take any risk we shouldn't be investing in uh, uh, mutual funds we should also be demanding in the sense that if you if you for instance there's something called overnight funds overnight funds carry very little risk because whatever is invested is invested in the evening and the money comes back to the mutual fund in the morning so the risk of that and because it happens on an rbi governed platform of is is relatively low or very low however risk starts appearing in say liquid funds and more in ultra short term funds we shouldn't assume that these are zero risk that there will be some risk now there's a bond fund called franklin ultra short bond fund it's been a phenomenal performer 9% average over 4 or 5 years but it has had two situations where it lost money in the past and there was a default by jindal steel which was uh, which have made them take a 25% haircut on those bonds of course the hit to the fund was smaller it was probably less than 1% but the fact is on that day you lost something which was a little bit less than 1% but you did lose money and then the fund of course after that it took that hit it was able to recover it from the remaining set of investments but that you were okay with it but this is the best performing ultra short term fund that has seen credit events hurt it in the past the good thing it was relatively a small position so if it was a 2% position and you lost 25% of that 2% position your hit was only 0.5% if ilfs was a 2% position in most of these mutual funds you would have not been so unhappy however when it's a 15% position it's too much so your job as an investor is to also sh- make sure that your investments not only that you understand your own risk profile but the investments that you're doing in mutual funds those mutual funds should have diversified if they haven't you need to walk away from that investment you need to monitor this every month that's why you shouldn't invest in 40 funds because if you do uh, you're not going to be able to track all of them so invest in a few funds and make sure that you understand the diversification within that your job is also to help identify what you need not diversify in for instance if i have 40% government debt i'm fine because god the government is unlikely to default if the government defaults we have bigger problems than what we're talking about so i don't think that is a useful diversification to say listen don't have uh, 40% government debt if that's what you want to do go ahead but you shouldn't have 40% in any single private company or group or even 20% or in fact even 15% so i would say cap exposures at 5% max and try and ensure that your fund lives up to that promise they have the ability to move things around and uh, from your perspective you should understand that when you as a as a collective lent 12 lakh crores to corporates through mutual funds it's very likely that half a percent to 1% of it 
will go bad. We've seen something go bad of the order of one or two thousand crores. But remember, one percent of twelve lakh crores is about twelve thousand crores. Yeah. So we should expect that there will be more damage, and that's more. There is more to come. So don't invest assuming things are going to be safe, and invest assuming that you will get a higher return, but only if there is higher risk. And this is the this is the way risk is hitting you right now. All right. At the risk of making a prediction, how do you see this panning out in general? I mean, going forward. So I, you know, interestingly, I think uh, <clears throat> markets don't have um, a lot of patience. Shay. In fact, many people who've invested with safety in mind are going to pull their money out. So what's going to happen is it's going to be discerning investors who are left behind who will be able to take this kind of risk in the, on, the, on their balance sheets who will be able to give money and say, listen, even if you have a little bit of a default, I don't care because I'm going to be in this fund for another three years. The second part of this equation is that um, people are going to find it difficult or unlikely that they're going to want to lend to mutual funds or give money to mutual funds who invest in these zero coupon bonds by these promoter companies. I think that source of financing for promoters is going to be a tap that's going to go off. That um, whether we like it or not is is probably not a great thing for stock markets because a lot of this money that was borrowed has found its way back into stock markets through some either an operator or, or something like that route. But it's a good thing because this was not supposed to be how, uh, this is not how markets are supposed to be. You're not supposed to use funds borrowed by pledging your shares to then go and buy more of your own shares, which is just a little too complicated. But I don't think this is the right way that uh, promoter companies should have done this. So I don't think they were going to get more funding. The third thing in this bond market is that we have some SEBI rules and government rules that require an incremental funding to be one fourth from the bond market, yeah. which means by the middle of this year, we're going to have a lot more issuers. Maybe because 12 lakh crores were chasing bonds and you didn't have enough issuers, uh, the mutual funds were tempted to give it to these promoter companies. But the minute you have good companies, MRF, SEAT, um, maybe uh, l &T, borrowing through the bond market more rather than borrowing directly from banks, that means you have more quality issuers that are available. If quality issues are available, why would I go and uh, take money from a... I mean, LNT is borrowing cost is still 9%. I'm happy to lend to LNT at 9% in the bond market, except LNT was never there in the bond market. It was not coming there. So you would, or rather it was there, but it was it was too small an issue. Now you end up with more capacity coming into bond markets, mutual funds having more things to subscribe to. So the profile of investments will change and the profile of investors will change. You're going to get more debt, uh, aware investors versus debt averse investors, you're also going to get a lot more um, uh, high quality cash flow based companies issuing debt in the debt markets versus the non cash flow based collateral based uh, bonds that are currently available. So largely, I feel this is a good thing for a market as an evolution. During that phase, we're going to see turmoil. Whether we like it or not, Things are going to look like, oh, it's the end of the world and then things are going to probably come back. I hope it's not as, we're not as badly leveraged as it was when Lehman was around and perhaps even when Bear Stearns was around, those were entities levered 30x. Today, the worst is probably DHFL, which is levered 10x. A JM or an Edelweiss are levered only 2 to 2.5 times. A Piramal is levered less than two times. So, these are companies with tremendous amount of capital and even if you shut them out of capital markets for a short period, they are not going to go under uh, because uh, their leverage is substantially lesser. So I think the system is a little more resilient than it was earlier. However, you do know that at this point, things are in in uh, flux. So we are going to see some lenders go under simply because they can't grow, some uh, mergers and acquisitions. And this will actually mean good things for bond markets in the end and for bond market investors. However, in the short term, I say as a mutual fund investor, go in there, look at what you've invested in. If you don't like it, walk away because you're, the risk is there. It It's present and you shouldn't be in if you don't understand the risk. And at the same time, if you understand the risk, stay in. This is a market that will reward you in the long term. Because as interest rates go down, bond markets are the ones that where money is going to be made. Mm -hmm. 
So that sounds like actionable advice for, uh, advice for these interesting times. So on that note, I think uh, we're good to wrap up today's show. So uh, thanks very much. And uh, for listeners, you can always uh, read more about what Deepak Shinoy has to say uh, and the rest of our team at CapitalMind.in. And if you're interested in investing with us, you can always have a look at CapitalMindWealth.com. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Shri. And it was a great time. Have a good one, folks.